Hey guys, it's Exorcizzle. As promised, I'm here to talk about Fatal Frame 3 today, my favorite Fatal Frame, and my favorite video game, period. Uh, taking that into consideration, please forgive me if this video is super long. I will be including another table of contents, so look for that in the description if you don't want to sit through the whole thing, which I will not blame you for, believe me. So I'm going to do things a little bit differently than last time and tell you about the history of our new haunted location first. This game takes place half in Ray's house and half in a dream version of the real-world Kuze Shrine known as the Manor of Sleep in the dream world. No one knows how old the Kuze Shrine is, but we can assume that the Engraving Shrine, at least, has been around for centuries. It is run almost entirely by women, with men only ever coming in during the winter. Behind the shrine, hidden away in the mountain itself, is the rift, and even further beyond that, the abyss of the horizon, a sea of endless night connecting our world to the spirit world. Let's talk about the rift for a second. The rift is a hellish force that must be subjugated by human sacrifice, much like the malice from the first game and the darkness from the second. It's a little more confusing, though, as it's both the ocean separating the last passage and the abyss of the horizon, as well as the miasma initially trapped in the Chamber of Thorns. In the Mutsu region where the game takes place, the word rift is used as a synonym for dreams. Much like the physical rift, these dreams, arising from love for the dead, connect the world of the living to the afterlife. Because of this, it's thought that when a person dreams frequently of lost loved ones and the pain of loss, their dreams become a gateway for the dead to return. This is where our new shrine maiden comes in, the Tattooed Priestess. People would come to the shrine to offer their pain to her, and since her goal was to sleep forever, she could keep their pain and therefore the rift in her dreams. Next, let's get into how the Tattooed Priestess came to be. She was a woman, possibly any age, although we don't see enough of them to say that for sure, chosen from the nearby villages by the Kuse family head. The only official prerequisite was that she had to have experienced the pain of losing a loved one so that she could relate to others offering their pain of loss and make it her own. After entering the shrine, she was never allowed to leave again and was kept in the hanging prison when she wasn't participating in various rituals. From my understanding, prior to being tattooed, she had to meditate with her mirror of loss, focusing all of her love, pain, and sadness into the mirror so that she could break it later on right before she was impaled, symbolically ridding herself of all earthly connections. After meditating, the next ritual was the piercing of the soul. Every time a new tattooed priestess was brought into the shrine, two female tattoo artists were brought in from the neighboring villages to become engravers. Like the tattooed priestesses, they were not allowed to leave after entering the shrine, possibly forced to dedicate the rest of their lives to the shrine. They were also forced to pierce their own arms with needles and then tattoo themselves so they could better understand the priestess's pain and so they could transfer the pain of loss to the priestess better. They were also required to gouge their eyes out for several different reasons, the first being that they may be able to see the priestess's dreams while awake, allowing for better tattoos. The second was so that they would have more spiritual power that they could then put into the tattoo. After their eyes were gouged out, rope was passed through their eye sockets, crossing between them, binding the sockets shut, further cutting off connection to the outside world. After the engravers prepared their own bodies, they would gather up the red and indigo ink and mix them together to form the ink of the soul. Red ink was regular ink mixed with the blood of the living, and indigo ink was regular ink mixed with the blood of the dead. People visiting the shrine to offer their pain would bring their own blood and the bodies of their dead loved ones so their blood could be drained in the Buddha room with all the hanging bodies so that their pain of loss would be permanently etched into the priestess. It's somewhat important to note that the shrine is run almost entirely by women, and this is one of the only times men are allowed in the shrine. They must wear masks so nobody catches feelings. With the Kuze family head watching and the priestess leg on a stone table in the engraving shrine, the snake and holly tattoo is etched into her flesh bit by bit over the span of the winter, eventually covering the priestess's entire body. After the tattoos were finished, the engraver's arms were cut off and cast away, maybe like a mini offering to the horizon. Who knows? After the piercing of the soul was complete, the priestess would take her mirror of loss and descend into the abyss behind the Kuze shrine into the depths of the mountain. At the shrine of loss in the last passage, she would shatter her mirror with her own hands, breaking all attachments to this world. She would then proceed down to the Chamber of Thorns, or from my understanding, the entrance to hell, for the impalement ritual. Prior to the impalement ritual, the family head had to find four young girls, either already in the Kuze family or from the nearby villages, and train them to become handmaidens. She would teach them all sorts of stuff, but focus primarily on teaching them the sleeping priestess lullaby and how to drive stakes through things. The handmaidens would also perform housekeeping and shrine duties, as well as provide companionship to the tattooed priestess, helping to make her pain bearable so she can sleep forever. With the family head watching over everything, the four girls each take a hammer and a tattooed stick and pin down her hands and feet while singing the ceremonial song and speaking prayers over her. Once the priestess was impaled, the four handmaids would continue impaling dolls, die in the ink of the soul, and enshrine them in their respective doll altars, singing the lullaby to further ensure the priestess would stay asleep. If the priestess did not stay asleep, either by succumbing to the pain, regretting her actions, or otherwise waking up, she is skinned alive. Skinned alive. What's left of her body is sent in a boat to the other side while her tattooed skin is enshrined in the tattoo altar. The skin is then sung to and prayed over so the pain the priestess took on does not escape back into the dreams of the living. The skin also serves as a warning to new priestesses. So what went wrong with the last tattooed priestess? Uh, we'll get there. Let's first take a look at Yashu, aka Catch These Hands, the most recent Kuze family head. Yashu's primary duty was to keep the shrine running as smoothly as possible to prevent the unleashing, the game's great disaster. 
As a child, she was possibly a handmaiden herself and then taught later on how to run the shrine by the family head before her. When she was old enough, she had a daughter with an unnamed man and named her Kyoka. Kyoka possibly became a handmaiden herself but was never officially trained to be the family head as far as we know. When Kyoka was old enough to have children herself, Yashu allowed Akito Kashiwagi, a folklorist, to stay in the shrine as a guest for the winter. Kyoka and Akito fell in love and he even made plans to sneak Kyoka and their unborn son out of the shrine when the snow melted. Yashu presumably found out about this plan and killed Akito, hiding his body and belongings so Kyoka would never find out. Their child turned out to be a boy, but boys weren't allowed in the Kuze shrine past the age of four. They were supposed to be thrown down a well. I wish I were making this up, but there is a well in the middle of the manor that they used to throw babies down. A well dedicated just to throwing babies down it. I'm not fucking kidding. Kyoka couldn't possibly kill her and Akito's love child, so she found a way to sneak him out of the shrine into a nearby village. Before Akito died, he gave Kyoka three echo stone earrings and he took one so that they could always hear each other's thoughts. Kyoka sent two of these earrings with Kaname, keeping one so that they all three would be connected. Yashu knew about Kyoka smuggling Kaname out and allowed it for unknown reasons. Maybe she had a soft spot? This is just a personal theory, but maybe Yashu had a son of her own before Kyoka and regrets killing him. Who knows? We know very little about Yashu's past before becoming the cold bitch she seems like she is now. Over time, Kyoka got progressively crazier and crazier, pining for Akito and hoping he and Konami would return for her. She spent hours brushing her hair, Akito's favorite part of her, and even began to remove it in clumps, pinning it up around her mirror. Yashu brought many men in to hopefully bear a female heir with Kyoka, but none of them could replace Akito. Eventually, Kyoka did have a daughter, though, and she named her Amane. She told Amane about Konami and the earring she sent with him, swearing Amane to secrecy. When Amane was old enough, she became a handmaiden herself and was in charge of caring for Reika Yukishiro, the last tattooed priestess. Coincidentally, Reika grew up in the same village as Konami, and it was here that they met and fell in love. At some point, Konami left the village to study in the city, leaving Reika with one of his Echo Stone earrings so they could still be connected. While he was gone, an unspecified disaster thought to be an avalanche occurred, killing Reika's entire family. Yashu sought her out to become the next tattooed priestess, not knowing her connection to her grandson, and with poor future prospects as a woman without a husband or family and no way to contact Konami, Reika agreed. Reika went to the shrine and became really good friends with Amane. She took joy in telling her about her life outside the shrine. Amane noticed Reika's special earring, and when she asked about it, Reika said it was a gift from a good friend and lets them hear each other's voices. Amane assumed this man was Konami. For the most part, everything went smoothly with Reika's rituals, but she really wanted to see Konami one last time. By carrying her dream of seeing a living person into the rift, she formed a connection with Konami, causing him to dream of the Kuze Shrine over and over again. While giving an account of these dreams to Dr. Azo, Konami heard Reika's voice through his earring and left in a panic, leaving the earring behind, explaining why it ends up being in used possession. Konami snuck into the shrine as a masked mourner there to offer his pain and end up meeting Amane who recognized him by the earring he was wearing. Confession time, I have no idea how many of these damn earrings there are. It seems like there's an endless supply. What the fuck? Either way, Amane wanted to help them meet just one more time because she loved both of them. Like, think of it this way. Her mom was batshit insane and she spent most of her time caring for Reika, so Reika probably became like an older sister or even a mom to Amane. And then the only other normal family member she has is Konami, who she hasn't even gotten to spend any time with. So she leads Konami down to the Chamber of Thorns, where Reika has already been impaled in hopes that maybe he can take Reika and her away from the shrine. Heartbreaking stuff. Sadly, that didn't work out, though, because there is no such thing as a happy ending in Fatal Frame. Konami entered the chamber and woke Reika up from her eternal slumber, giving her one last moment of happiness. Yashu had heard from someone, presumably another handmaiden, that Amane had snuck a man into the Chamber of Thorns, which was pretty much the most taboo thing Amane could have done. Presumably thinking Reika was still asleep, Yashu killed her own grandson right in front of Reika, causing her so much pain that she could no longer keep the tattoos from entering her eyes, turning them into mirrors, which in turn caused the unleashing. The unleashing is both the rift escaping from the underworld and the reflection of the priestess's pain back to the ones who offered it to her. Reika began to wander the manor, and everywhere she wandered was engulfed by the rift. The rift spreads much slower than the malice in the first game and the darkness in the second game, even with Reika wandering around, and while it does cause everyone to be engraved with the pain of the holly, it possibly took years to kill everyone off. Yashu spent the rest of her time hiring shrine carpenters to come in and try to seal a shrine off. They built two large extensions to the shrine, the rift shrine and the sleep shrine. I could be wrong about both of these since they seem pretty vague, but it appears that this area is the rift shrine, and this area is the sleep shrine. The rift shrine was built first and appears to include the shrine courtyard that is sealed off and full of miasma until hour 10 and anything beyond that leading to the last passage. The courtyard and the engraving shrine were both sealed into the depths of a large mountain to keep the rift from spreading and to keep Reika wandering inside the cavern forever. After the rift shrine failed to contain the rift, Yashu ordered the shrine of sleep be built. The shrine of sleep is pretty much everything that the rift shrine doesn't encompass. After the shrine of sleep was built, the manor was sealed off. Yashu ordered Tengai Narumi, the hash slinging slasher, and his buddies, the Moria carpenters, to murder all of the shrine carpenters and stuff them in the walls to be used as sacrificial pillars. After this, the Moria carpenters willingly buried themselves alive within the walls of the manor. Tengai even got his own special room in the center of the stained hallway to kill himself in, the lucky bastard. So what happened to Amane? After returning from killing Konami, covered in holly in an excruciating pain, Yashu ordered the other three handmaidens, Hisame, Shigure, and Minamo, to impale Amane at the bottom of the abyss. 
This was custom for any shrine dedicate that violated the Kuze family code, so she was just doing her job, but it's still heartbreaking. Amani was only five to nine years old, and she just wanted to be with her brother and her best friend. What the fuck, Yashu? After the Shrine of Sleep was finished, Kyoko was forced to move to the enclosed room above the hearth room where she was eventually taken by the rift, still pining for Akito. Her last regret was leaving behind his earring and a picture of him in her now sealed off old room. Right before her death, Yashu ordered Hisame to perform the final impalement, a ritual only carried out in extreme circumstances if all existing sacrificial pillars failed to contain the rift. The eldest or most responsible handmaiden, in this case Hisame, impaled the remaining handmaidens in the enclosed room directly above Tengai's suicide room. Hisame was the last to die, even Yashu died before, but she was happy to be alone in the manor because the manor was so open and dark, just like a dream. Her last words were, I'm going to sleep now, forever and ever. After everyone died, the real world Kuze shrine was abandoned, and by the time the game starts, only the area around the entrance is left, but the complete manor as it was is still the same in the dream world. It is now known as a haunted house where the living can meet the dead. Now let's talk about the tattooed curse. Fun fact, it's never actually called anything in games, so that's just a fan term. Use notes from the guidebook call it the dream disease, which I kind of like better, but whatever. This game is pretty much all about survivor's guilt, so of course the way to get cursed is to survive a traumatic experience resulting in the death of a loved one and then blaming yourself for surviving. Another fun way to get it is being dreamed about by someone who already has the curse. You don't even have to have a dead loved one of your own. It can just fucking happen. The victim will then begin to have the same dream over and over again, typically about the loved one they lost. These strong feelings for the dead then summon the manner of sleep dream. Victims see a large snowy manor and a mass funeral procession heading into it. This is because victims always see the Kuze Shrine as it was in its heyday, so they're actually watching people go into the shrine to offer their pain to the priestess. They see their dead loved one enter the house, and just before the door closes, they follow in after them, even though most know there is no turning back once they're inside. From this point on, the victim dreams of the manor of sleep every single night, following their loved ones deeper and deeper into the manor. They discover extensions added haphazardly here and there, and some of these extensions are places the victim is familiar with in real life. Eventually, the victim can no longer avoid Reika, and once she touches them, they are screwed. She transfers a little bit of her tattoo to the victim, and it slowly and painfully spreads over their body over the course of a month. Only victims with a tattooed curse can see this tattoo, leading doctors to believe that they're hallucinating. They also see people that aren't there, people that slipped into the real world from the manner of sleep. They experience a decrease in waking hours to the point where they sleep for days at a time, and eventually they can no longer wake up. The tattoo covers their entire body and enters their eyes, causing them to see what Reika saw in her final moments, and then they just disappear, leaving a soot-like black stain. Okay, so I think that's where we're going to end things for today. I'm going to be trying to upload a second part to this in about a month or so. These take a really, really long time to make. So if you'd like to subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. I'm trying to get 100 subs by February, and I'm getting real close, so we'll see. Also, I respond to almost all my comments, so if you'd like to discuss the series or ask me a question, feel free to do so. I would really like that. Please do it. Have a good day. Bye.